The Oklahoma legislature has officially wrapped up business, and this week we're bringing you a quick update on what you need to know from the end of session. After that, we're talking about all of the votes and information that were taken at the National Association of Realtors Board of Directors meeting. All of the updates in one episode. Here we go. Welcome back to Talking Real, brought to you by the Oklahoma Association of Realtors. This is episode 120 of Talking Real back in the studio. And Nabil, how's your day? <laughs> Going well. I'm on my second cup of coffee. Everybody's yeah. a little sleepy this Tuesday yeah. morning. We've been doing a lot of yawning before we get started, so we're going to try to pep it up a little bit and get an exciting episode of Talking Real for you. It's always exciting. Absolutely. <laughs> Uh, this week, we also have, starting off with us for a little bit, Josh Cockroft joins us because we've had a few more exciting things happen with the Oklahoma legislature that he's going to help update us on. So, Josh, how are you today? Uh, sorry, I dozed off. What was happening? <laughs> <laughs> so, there's no microphone in front of you. <laughs> <laughs> no, I'm good. So, uh, yeah, let's get started with um, a little bit of legislative update. We've got maybe our last legislative update of the year unless something crazy happens uh, which is always possible it's never over yeah, this needs to be the last update <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> so we had a few things happen um first of all tell us about uh, what's going on with the end of session we've we've finished technically right yeah i mean for as crazy as this year was uh it kind of all wrapped up in a bang uh the legislature adjourned, adjourned sine die which latin for the end of the end um or something like that um everybody says yeah. something different the but end the, end. the end of the end right it's ominous <laughs> yeah exactly um or the, the close of business however you want to look at it uh on friday they adjourned sine die um the senate actually adjourned sine die the 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 House kind of did something a little bit different that I'll get to here in a second. But really, for the last two weeks, the legislature had been working uh, extremely fast, uh, extremely hard, trying to wrap up the state budget. There was some drama that was going on with the state budget between the legislative branch and the executive branch. Uh, the legislature wrapping up some higher priority bills that they wanted to finish. You had suspension of rules so that things could move faster. You had vetoes. You had a little bit of everything in the last two weeks, but they have kind of wrapped up uh, most of their business, hopefully uh, all of their business, um, and will be uh, out of session hopefully until next February when they come back in. So it's been a crazy two weeks. Yeah, that it, it was kind of a... An interesting deal, because last time you were on, we were looking at sessions starting back up. Right. And, okay, what kind of priority legislation? And I was shocked at how much legislation actually happened. I mean, I thought it was going to be come back, do the budget, and maybe a few other things. But it was more than a few. Yeah, it was. I mean, in the grand scheme of things, you're looking at 2,500 bills that were introduced this year. They churned through about 150 in the last two weeks, but it was constant uh, on top of all of the budget bills. Um, so they did pass a state budget. Both the House and the Senate approved uh, the overall budget or most of the components of the budget. It's more than just one bill. Uh, there's a bunch of different parts. Uh, they approved most of it by a pretty wide margin, a veto proof margin. So you have to have two thirds vote in both the House and the Senate to override a veto. And so when it's a veto proof, it means the budget bills really, for the most part, went through with a two thirds majority. Passed that on to the, the governor. There was, um, like I mentioned, there was a little bit of drama with the governor not agreeing with the process. He felt like he had been left out of the negotiating room on several instances. Uh, and he ended up vetoing the main budget bill as well as some other trailers, uh, trailer bills that had to do with the budget. So um, within hours of him <laughs> vetoing that 
uh, those bills, the legislature came in, made a very strong statement, and said this is how it's going to be. It's the process that you know our state constitution lies out. Um, they followed that process to a T and overrode all of his vetoes so far on the budget. So the budget that was passed uh, by the legislature, then vetoed, now it is in effect for the next fiscal year. So just a refresher, that looks like about a 4% cut across the board for most agencies. There's some differences um, in some of the agencies that they're looking to carve out and put some exceptions for, but uh, about a 4% cut to all state agents because agencies because of all the coronavirus drama. Yeah. I think it's interesting because it shows that in Oklahoma, we actually have a fairly weak governor yes. position. Now, last year, they did give a lot more authority to the governor to hire and fire agency heads. Right. That was kind of a big government accountability kind of deal. Uh, but we then see this year that when it comes to passing a budget, I mean, the legislature absolutely is in control. And when they are really on almost anything, when they are in agreement pretty across the board, they can override those vetoes. So sure. Um, and to see it happen so quickly. I mean, it was like that was said, the shocking part was yeah. the I mean, it was literally within hours yeah. of him of, of, of vetoing it, that they just overrode that veto and kept plowing on. Yeah, I, I bet they had some inclination that it was going to get vetoed and they were yes. ready to go. They, they knew that was they, they were ready. Yeah. 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 They knew. So with these last hundred and something bills that we're going through, um, we had, a, I guess, one kind of big one that we were dealing with. Um, give us a little update on what was going on. What was that bill and where are we today? So it kind of ties into the state budget discussion. Um, part of that state budget that was negotiated and agreed upon by the House and the Senate included a bill, uh, House Bill 2760, which dealt with the Oklahoma Affordable Housing Tax Credit. Now, this bill was introduced very early in session along with all the other bills, but very suddenly, um, about 11 days ago, the House of Representatives dropped brand new language in it um, and pass it off the floor within 24 hours. So very little reaction time. Uh, but what it would do, uh, what the bill would have done was uh, reduce the yearly allocation that is paid out on projects that are ongoing and already in the pipeline for affordable housing in the state of Oklahoma. It goes towards the developers to make sure that these projects are available and being built. It would cut the yearly allocation from $4 million to $2 million. So 50% incre or decrease um, the concern was that the language was retroactive, so it would have affected all of the projects from 2014 since the inception of the incentive program. All of those projects that are in the pipeline, you can't get the credit unless uh, the unit is completely built. You can't get the credit unless you have full capacity of the unit. So it takes a long time, over two years, to actually get the money that is front, uh, available through the credit. But this bill would have cut it by 50% from $4 million to $2 million. So we got to work with a lot of other industry partners, uh, State Chamber, the Affordable Housing Coalition, the City Chambers. Uh, there was a, a whole litany, uh, the, the Bankers Association that came out in opposition to the bill. We began to work the bill really strongly after the House had passed it. They passed it narrowly, goes over to the Senate. It um, actually looked for a while while the bill while the vote was being held that it was going to fail, but leadership, because of it being a budget bill, kind of convinced some individuals to switch their vote, and so it passed narrowly in the Senate, where it went on to the governor's desk, and that's when uh, that's where our focus has been over the last few days is working uh, the executive branch and sending some letters, uh, making sure our members were active and engaged and and uh, outlining our concerns with the executive branch. Uh, we were very excited to learn last night that it was vetoed by the governor. Um, there's a little bit of question right now, is the legislature going to try to override that? But I think, um, you know, through the work that we're doing, we're communicating with some of those members today. Um, because it passed so narrowly out of the House and the Senate, uh, that we have veto, uh, we're, we're, we're safe from a veto. So, uh, but we got to remain vigilant on that until the legislature uh, actually adjourns sine die. So uh, it's, it, that, that bit has been a little crazy, but we did have other successes as well towards the end of session, um, seeing uh, the occupational licensing bill that we'd had a lot of concerns about throughout session, that was not heard. So we're safe for another year at least on that. Um, we were able to get the um, 
the Oklahoma Home Builders Association's bill on residential designs, aesthetic designs, uh, making sure that those were protected, um, that municipalities couldn't come in and change the rules of the game. Uh, we got that through, and it's on the governor's desk ready for signature as well. So we kind of snuck that in on on the end. So it was actually very successful into the session. Crazy year, obviously, but now we look towards next year. Yeah, it's kind of interesting. We thought we were going to have a very light year. And in some respects, with session taking a, a sideline during most of the last couple of months, um, in that respect it was. We didn't have any priority legislation we requested but then they come back and it's sort of fast, furious, yep. get it, get some bills passed, keep some bills from passing and um, going so far as uh, obtaining that veto from the governor um, after some some strong lobbying there. So you're ready for a break. Yes, yeah. absolutely. And it's crazy how things change in 24 hours. Oh, like yeah. you were saying with that bill, it's. I think that's like right up against the deadline, right? They have to give 24 hours before. Well, actually, they had suspended some of those rules because we were at the end of session. They had suspended a lot of rules regarding the 24-hour rule, uh, how long it takes to hold a vote open. There were a lot of things that they changed because they were trying to get so much work done. So that's why they were able to drop the language in here almost immediately. So you've got to remain vigilant. Yep. The and rules, good thing you were. <laughs> the, they make the rules and then they protect you as long as they... As long as they feel like it. <laughs> yeah. And so never... Until never, they're like, let's change this rule. <laughs> exactly. Never fully trust the rules because they made them and, and they can change them immediately. So interesting. Well, Josh, thank you so much for keeping an eye on things and coming back to Talking Real every once in a while to give us those updates. And again, I look at this as another successful legislative session. Absolutely. Um, it doesn't necessarily have the like, look at all these bills we passed, but um, obviously a lot of really good work was done to protect the real estate industry this year. Um, that is that a little more under the radar, but also very, very important from, again, the affordable housing issues and the design aesthetics, which was a really big deal. Mm -hmm. I mean, that was a kind of a, a, a big one that we were working on. So thanks for leading the charge there and, and running the day-to-day -day stuff there and our whole government affairs committee that's been tuned in and um, dealing with these issues for most of the year. So everybody has a well-earned break now as session officially wraps up. See you next year. See you next year <laughs> on Talking Real. <laughs> well, Thanks, you'll Josh. see us next week. <laughs> <laughs> Thanks, Josh. Well, Nabil, I think we should spend a little bit of time talking about some of the interesting policy changes that came out of the NAR mid-year board of directors meeting. Yeah, and you know, mid-year this year was a little different. It was quite a bit different. Um, uh, we weren't in D.C. Right. Uh, in fact, we were sitting behind our computer screens. Uh, but one good thing that I think came out of that was a lot more people participated in the mid-year conference than they do, you know, physically. Right. So I think that was cool because it gave the people that weren't are not able to usually go there a chance to kind of sit in on some sessions and um, get that extra bit of knowledge and know what's happening at the mothership. <laughs> for sure, for sure. So it was definitely interesting. I thought that um, the quick shift to turning it into virtual meetings was handled really well for oh, the yeah. scope mm -hmm. and. Um, I definitely tuned into some sessions on like professional standards and risk management, those kinds of things. So yeah, it was interesting and I, it seems like it turned out pretty well. Yeah. Yeah. I wonder if this is going to open the doors for a few other things down the line. Yeah, for sure. Uh, so at the end of mid-year, they have a board of directors meeting. So NAR board of directors, I think meets twice a year at mid-year and at the annual conference towards the end of the year. And in this case, they, they always look at various policy changes and things like that. And some of these are important for people to kind of be aware of. Um, they can affect, you know, things like professional standards. So some of those ethical standards that are in place you need to make sure what's going on there. You know, this is where they potentially change dues and those kinds of things. So we wanted to talk about those just to let you know what was going on at NAR so that you understand what those national policies are that affect all of us mm -hmm. um, in the industry. Yeah, so let's let's kind of give a little bit of summary. We're not going to hit every single thing that happened right. in the meeting. That would take a few episodes. Right, right. <laughs> uh, but kind of the highlights. Yeah. So I think the first one that's um, interesting, and I don't actually know what, what spawned this one, but this is good. This protects the broker's um, MLS content. So mm -hmm. in this case, the NAR board voted to establish 
um, the right of MLS participants to receive a data feed of their own listing information. Um, which is which makes sense. Yeah, exactly. Right. So basically what it says, the actual policy is that upon request, the MLS has to provide the participant, so the broker, a data feed containing at minimum all active MLS listing content put into the MLS under that participant. Um, so yeah, that's, I think, good maybe there were some questions about places that weren't necessarily giving idx fees or something like that again i don't know exactly what spawned yeah. this um, but it's good to know that as a as a broker you have an absolute right to have a feed of of your listing data in the mls yeah that's good yeah list somewhere else on your For website sure. whatever that is yep uh the second big thing that happens at this meeting is um election of officers yeah so the directors elected Leslie Smith from Texas as president-elect and Kenny Parcell from Utah as the first vice president for 2021. Absolutely. And Nancy Lane of Mississippi was elected the 2021-22 treasurer. Very good. Congratulations so, to all of the new officers of NAR. Yeah. Very cool. Uh, the next thing, we've got some news on setting the dues for 2021. And good news, there is no <laughs> dues increase for NAR for 2021. So the dues are going to remain the same. There's an estimate that there may be a decline in NAR membership a little bit to $1.3 million. Um, and then they're going to continue to have $150 per year on the dues. Yeah. And interestingly, it says just because we budgeted for this doesn't mean we have to spend it. Right. Which is always true. Absolutely. <laughs> Absolutely. If it's in the budget, it doesn't mean you spend it. <laughs> exactly. Exactly. So, but there you go. Some good news. It won't yep. cost you any more to be a member <laughs> Yay. of NAR. <laughs> uh, the next big thing uh, was the legal action funding. Yeah. And uh, the board approved legal action funding for an Illinois property rights case a New Jersey case involving independent contractor status and a Missouri case involving realtors ability to provide floor plans without violating the architectural copyright. Uh, so, I mean, what's your takeaway from this? I think this is okay. So what this is, is NAR takes part of those dues, right? We talked about the dues. Why am I paying $150 a year for NAR dues? Well, one of the things that that translates to is this legal action fund. And if you consider what's going on here, they will identify cases throughout the country where there are very important property rights issues at stake, and they will hire good, high-powered lawyers to come in and they'll help fund the case to make sure that the realtor's interest is being protected in these cases. So they're filing supplemental briefs or helping afford the costs of attorneys to handle these cases so that there's not a situation out there where there's a bad set of facts or maybe somebody's involved in a lawsuit but doesn't have the funding to actually have you know, a, a good lawyer who understands those issues help them that could create very bad case law for realtors um, and could interfere with protecting those property rights. So I think this is great that that resource is available, that when this big case happens, um, again, they can get involved. The independent contractor status, I mean, that's an important thing for mm -hmm. the entire, if, if that gets changed, then we've got a, an entire breakdown of how business is done in like 90% per plus of, of brokerages out there. Um, so yeah, it's a, it's a big deal that we can do this. I think this is great. And again, this just helps fund this legal action to make sure that realtors interests are being protected. Yeah. Yeah. Cause like you were saying, a lot of times these cases are extremely big for any individual to carry. Right. So yeah. I think, I think that's fantastic for that support and it sets a precedence for the future. Absolutely. Absolutely. Uh, the next one is some diversity and inclusion. And in this, they recognize um, state associations that have a functioning diversity and inclusion committee. And of course, they're kind of encouraging states to look at this as an option um, to maybe set one up. And so we don't have one at the state right now. Some of our local associations have diversity committees. Mm -hmm. And what we're talking about is, you know, this would be a committee that recommends policy and action uh, regarding the inclusion of diversity in the association's government, but also recommend strategies and actions to help identify, recruit, and mentor future leaders 
at the state level who represent the diversity of our markets and the membership of the association, and also provide guidance and support for local associations in their diversity and inclusion efforts. So we don't have one at the state level at the moment, uh, but kind of looking at that as an option, uh, seeing if we maybe need to set one up. So interestingly, I think if, if you think that would be a good idea or have any input on that, go ahead and send us an email to podcast at okrealtors.com and let us know what you think about creating a uh, diversity and inclusion committee at the state level that we don't have right now. And if you think that would be a, a valuable thing for us to move forward with, again, diversity is important. Inclusion mm -hmm. is important. Uh, we already um, have that kind of embodied as part of our purpose, uh, but actually having a committee set up to be uh, maybe a little more proactive about it and come up to with some ideas. It a little bit. Yeah, yeah. Absolutely. absolutely. Do you think that's stemming from, uh, you know, like kind of the the corporate take on diversity and kind of having like a, you know, a staggered workforce, essentially? Yeah, I mean, I think that it's, it's just a, a recognition that there are a lot of things that maybe we haven't paid very good attention to. And we need to look at uh, making sure that all of our policies, all of our actions that we're taking, that we're doing so in a way that that isn't just accidentally discriminatory or that we're not mm. really engaging the community because realtors should represent the communities that they serve. And if we have underserved communities, well, what are we doing as an association to make sure that the real estate transactional needs of those com communities are being met? And you can only do that by being proactive. It doesn't happen by accident. And so helping to identify where are underserved areas and what can we do to help you know, improve upon that, both in terms of bringing people into the industry to represent those communities, and then also as an association, what we can do to help better serve those communities. Yeah. So I think it's an interesting idea. So let us know what you think about creating a diversity and inclusion committee at the state level. Yep. The next thing I know, this is right up your wheelhouse as well. Um, can't believe I just said wheelhouse. Yeah, uh, that's my word. <laughs> uh, is professional standards. Yeah. Uh, the board approved a change to the Code of Ethics and Arbitration Manual to require an explanation when a member files an amended complaint. Absolutely. The goal is to give respondents a full and fair opportunity to defend themselves against the new allegations without necessitating continuance of a hearing. Right. So this is... It's a relatively small deal, but it's also important that, you know, somebody files a complaint, they have to provide facts that show that, okay, I say that this person, this realtor violated Article 1 of the Code of Ethics, and here's the facts that make me think that happened. And, and it, the way that manual was written, that if you wanted to amend your complaint, it didn't require you to state the, like, state the facts of why you're amending that complaint and, and giving some information about that. And you could just of, do it. Yeah. So part of due process is making sure the respondent knows what the charges are against them so they can defend themselves. Right. And this is really kind of a cleanup deal. Uh, but again, it's, it's important to make sure that the process stays uh, both fair for everybody and also as efficient as possible. Yeah. And I know here at the state level, we have a robust professional standards um, program that we offer. And um, it, it, it's utilized by, you know, everyone statewide. And if you want to take advantage of that, go on to our website, okrealtors.com yes. forward slash ethics. Yes. And there you get an overview of the whole program. And it's if you need to use it, you, it's super easy to fill out a form. And uh, Allison... Yes. Our professional standards compliance person. <laughs> <Yes>. <laughs> Forget the actual title. She is fantastic on staying on top of all of these and getting things scheduled. And even during the time where we were not in the office, you know, keeping keeping the ball moving and making sure everything was still uh, staying on track for the dates. Absolutely. So we've been doing some interesting things. We've had um, for a while we've been doing it, but it's having some of our grievance committees through a teleconference to make sure that we're at least getting complaints through that. We haven't had any teleconference hearings, but we're exploring those opportunities yet. yet. Um, we're doing it right now where if the parties will agree to it, we will do it. But um, you know, sometimes we're having issues where parties aren't interested in doing it. So we're having to kind of push things off uh, because we haven't been able to meet for hearings, but we're getting ready to start ramping those back up. Um, but also we're gonna be having a mediation soon on a case uh, via teleconference. So 
that's kind of exciting to see how that's going to go. And we're just going to keep using technology to the best that we can and keep mm-hmm. this process rolling to the best that we can when we're in this situation where we can't always get together in a room and, and have our hearings. But we'll get those going as soon as we can. Right. And I think eventually a lot more people will get a lot more comfortable with the teleconference aspect of things. So Absolutely. Yeah. Absolutely. So the last thing that we want to touch on that the directors did was approve a policy in favor of a federal home ownership tax credit that would incentivize taxpayers to purchase and own a primary residence. Um, ideally, this policy um, says that the tax credit would be for households that no longer itemize deductions and would provide a higher benefit in the first year and would recognize geographic housing cost differences. Uh, but again, the idea is that getting a little bit of a tax break uh, tax credit for having that home ownership and encouraging it, which we think is important that um, home ownership is still valued and, and accessible to people and incentivized. So I think yeah. that's a, a good policy. To I consider. mean, that's that's one of our big things. Absolutely. Is promote home, home ownership. So. Absolutely. So that's the bulk of the updates that we wanted to bring you. Again, you can go see everything that happened. If you head on over to nar.realtor, they've got a report up there that'll give you some more information if you're interested to see what else happened. But I think we gave all the information that would be relevant to the state of Oklahoma, at least. Yeah. And we'll link this in the show notes as well. So uh, you can hop on over to the website real quick and check it out for yourself. Absolutely. So there's all the updates for you. Legislative, NAR, legislative conference <laughs> and board of directors, all that, all updated. I- internal and external legislation. <laughs> yes. So consider yourself updated. Um, again, we appreciate everybody coming back every week. We hope that some of our topics on uh, the coronavirus uh, doing business in this time period have been helpful um, as we slowly start to uh, return to a little bit of um, normal work activity and trying to get some more guests in the studio that we can have some conversations with. Uh, you know, give us a shout out to podcast at okrealtors.com if you've got some kind of topic that you're interested in hearing or a guest you would like for us to get on the show. We're always looking for that kind of feedback and whatever you want to listen to, that's what we want to deliver. Mm-hmm. So reach out to us there. That's right. And my last parting thought would be a quote from Bob Goldberg, NAR CEO, who quoted rocker Frank Zappa, without deviation from the norm, progress is not possible. Absolutely. So use this time to learn and grow and find new innovative ways to do business. And we will emerge stronger than we were before. Yep. And share this podcast with a friend. Please do. And until next time, we'll see you next Tuesday on Talking Real.